So, David Duffy, uh, thanks very much for joining me. I, I've been fascinated to, to get you on to this Creative Career Talks series for, for quite some time, ever since we had a conversation in Madrid mm -hmm. uh, a little while ago. And so, uh, yeah, I'm delighted to have you here. And so I think what might be useful is, I guess, to get a little context about yourself, where you're coming from, where you are now, because it, it definitely looks quite sunny and, and nice in there. It's not particularly <laughs> Irish or in London. Um, but for those of you who, I guess, are watching who don't necessarily know, David is a, a producer of music, a musician, a composer of music, uh, also a, an entrepreneur, I've discovered over the time as well. So David, what we might do is, if you could help me just talk through a little bit about, I guess just for relevance for those who are watching, a bit about your journey, so to speak. So I know you're a Waterford man, uh, mm -hmm. like myself, and then yeah, you went yeah. down to Cork and you did a master's down there um, in, in music composition, is that right? Yeah, contemporary classical. It was the first year UCC ran a master's in in contemporary classical composition with John Godfrey and Jesse Renault down there. And yeah, we were the guinea pigs, but it, it had its benefits, I think as well, you know, to do it that way. Um, and that just kind of led on from my BMOS when I was there, I was studying with John and I really enjoyed like working with those guys. They're just this big open mind and it was lovely to, to then continue and do the masters there as well. Well, it sounds like it's produced a career that has sort of extended and grown in multiple directions. So clearly whatever they were doing there, yeah, the open-minded stuff. But you were saying before, actually, we started recording around that first sort of 10 year period when you left uh, university, which was predominantly sort of, I guess, traditional, traditional music career to a degree. So playing live uh, in lots of different venues and, and setups. Um, so tell us a bit about that. What was your experience when you first left University College Cork? What were you doing fundamentally for those uh, that first 10 years? Hmm. I mean, I was, just to say in general, I feel like I've been really lucky with my career and I was lucky with the instrument I had, which was, which was double bass mm -hmm. when I entered the college. So my, my career pretty much started year one of college, very luckily, because when I came in with Upright, even all the fourth year students wanted, any of the guys that were playing jazz wanted an Upright player and there wasn't really a lot of Upright players. Um, and the head of the music department in UCC, um, Paul O'Donnell, as well had already started some student bands that were playing weddings, playing gigs at the jazz festival, things like that. So pretty much from first year of music school, I was already out playing with Paul and out gigging um, straight away doing like doing a lot of uh, just general work like reception wedding receptions weddings all the while still doing kind of the artistic thing and so my career always had those two strands straight away from college which was this feeling that there was there was work and there was the stuff I wanted to do the kind of creative stuff all the while the work being very enjoyable, very fun and feeding in and the two of them having a lot of crossover and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so the first, the first 10 years were, I mean, 10 years is a long time. A lot happened in 10 years. But um, after the first year, two years out of college, um, I formed Eat My Noise with another uh, guy I studied with, Peter Power, another Waterford man. Um, so we, we formed that company when we left college, which was basically diving into this classical electronic crossover thing that was kind of starting for us. And the idea of making that more accessible, more exciting to younger audiences and to, to new people. Um, and, and intelligently as well, I think at the time we kind of discovered this whole Arts Council funding model and, and how we might actually get these things made, these huge ideas we wanted to make, get them made. Um, so we, we dove straight into that um, and we were making our first show, Evolution, was in 2012. So that was about two years after leaving college, once that started. All the while, I was still playing with the Hard Rounds, Niall McKay Band, Jack O'Rourke, um, and doing all these wedding gigs, doing all these drinks receptions, um, playing the panto, playing in pits for 
for whatever shows. Um, really just taking everything that came at me. Like anytime anyone asked me to do something, my gut feeling was always to say yes. I think for the first 10 years of my career, I don't think I said no to anything really. Um, it's only lately I'm learning that, that if you want to be a little bit focused, no is a very good word. But at the time I didn't feel like I had the, the choice to say no and I didn't want to say no. I was just so intrigued and inspired by every proposition that came my way. And if it had something to do with music, I was like, okay, let's, let's do that. You know, let's, hmm. let's try it. And, um, and in many cases, those 10 years were also defined by like continuously wading in kind of above my, my depth continuously where people would ask me to do something I had no idea to do. And I say, yeah, okay. Like there was some salsa band from Limerick said, can you fill in this salsa gig? It's in three weeks time. And I was like, uh, okay. Like I've never played Latin music, but okay. You know, and just dove really deeply into Latin music for three weeks and then did the gig. And I think of so many anecdotes like that where people just asked me to do something I couldn't do and just kind of said yes. And, and in the process of saying yes, learned a huge amount, which, which really opened up a lot for me, I think. You know? So, wow, there's so much in there as there would be in 10 years, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a big question. Yeah, it is. Um, I, what, what comes out to me, though, is, is a few things. One is that, like, idea of there being two strands of work that were there from the very beginning, the, the kind of creative work and the work work, yeah. as you described it. Sort of, I've heard described as, as, as good work and great work. Okay, and yeah. Great work is that kind of, you know, creative, completely love to do it, don't care if not being paid, and good work being that sort of, Happy to be paid for it, using most of my skills, fair bit of autonomy. But um, yeah. it sounds like that was there for you to begin with, and that's always kind of crossed over. And something else you kind of mentioned as well that some other people have mentioned too, this idea of there's a point at which you learn to say no to some work. And you're mm -hmm. kind of describing it as if you want to be more focused, actually, there's a point now where you, you choose to say no to stuff. And I guess... I got a lot of questions, but I'm also curious to know whether you still have, and I'll save this question for later, whether you still okay. have that sense of jumping into stuff that you are not by any means prepared to, you know, knowledgeable of in the same way mm -hmm. you have done when you were first saying things. But just to jump right back before we carry forward again, and it's a question that I think is really uh, important, I think, for creatives or artists especially, is sort of the very beginning. So I think there's, there's clear points where, you know, you might discover you like playing an instrument and you might play a lot of it at school. And then it's a point where maybe you might decide to go into university, maybe. Yeah. But there's another point, I think, when you decide yourself, oh, actually, yeah, I, I really want to do this professionally. Something yes. occurs or something internal happens where you go, yeah, this is the moment I, I want to do this professionally. What, what was that for you or was there one? You know, in a weird way, there wasn't a dis there was never a decision to be made, I feel, because mm -hmm. I always, uh, I mean, maybe it's a little bit cheesy to say, but I always just like followed my, my heart and followed my intention, which was like, I love this. This gives me so much curiosity. This gives, gives me so much passion. This is what I want to do. And of course, I always had these voices on the outside going, yeah, but can you do it? Like, will you be able, like, either from parents or um, from so many places saying, like, you can't, it's going to be a very difficult life making a career in music. There's always that logical side that I had. And then that was kind of in opposition to this passionate side that just said, well, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and so not really, like I was playing in bands from when I was 13 or 14, like around Waterford with bands like Raptus and um, oh, I can't remember, Berries Blue and just so many bands before that when I was kind of going up in Waterford and um, and that organically led to the college thing. And as I said, when I landed in college, year one, I was gigging straight away. So I was making money from year one playing music, which in a way gave me the assurance that, okay, you can live from this. There is a living to be had here, um, which I hadn't really ever had to think about before college. Um, I had summer jobs. I wasn't making money from music. The first time I started making money from music was really that first year in college. Um, so no, I mean, in terms of when I decided to be a musician, I think there is a clear point where 
Um, I remember going to like a Pearl Jam gig when I was 15 and I was tiny, like just, I'm, I'm still small, but then I was a really tiny guy and I was just at this concert and someone asked, do you want to go crowd surfing? I was like, okay, sure. So the guy picked me up during like uh, Oceans, which is one of my favorite Pearl Jam songs. And I remember crowd surfing for about two minutes because I was just super small and light and it was just not what I imagined crowd surfing would be. It was very floaty, calm experience. And at that point, it was like a complete sold out point. And I remember like looking back at this crowd of thousands of people, like cheering and just in awe at this band on stage. And at that moment, I kind of had a connection with, with the crowd and with the band and with the music. And I kind of knew that really gave me passion for so many years. That memory just kind of stayed with me as this feeling I wanted to kind of keep, like I always wanted to tap into that, like the, the scale of that, the size of that, and, and um, the connection of that, the connection with people from that. So that, I always remember that as like the final moment when I said, I want to do this. Like I want to be a musician, I want to make this happen. But I was very young, like that was, as I said, 14 or 15 when I made that decision. And the rest just kind of followed because I just kept following that passion and, and making a living just kind of organically came from that because I was always, um, it was never work. Like, I, I don't think I ever called it work. I think I only started calling it work maybe in the last five years with, with certain jobs, but it, it was never, and I used to hate people that did it when I was in bands and even in my twenties, like people going playing weddings, even people would be so down about going playing weddings. And I was like, I don't know, I get to play the bass, I get to play music, I'm getting paid well, I'm with my friends. It's pretty it's fine for me, you know? Yeah. I, I pref way, way prefer doing this than whatever job I don't want to do. Um, yeah. that, that, that Pearl Jam story is going to stay. It's like, a, it's like a scene from a film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is, yeah. I can see how that would have made an impression, you know? Uh, I, I, I'm curious, though, how did... You know, those, are those initial voices that were, look, this might be a difficult life for you, David, choosing to do this, that were being murmured at that period, just, you know, post, post the gig, 16 onwards, I imagine. Uh, how did you go about quelling those? Because I think anyone with an interest in, in kind of creative arts will have somewhere, someone saying, this probably isn't the wise thing for you to do. Yeah. Uh, what allowed you to kind of push through that? Um, I mean, my parents, of course, uh, were a huge help and they're just incredible people. And they, you know, they, we did a lot at the time, to be honest, I had the clarity that I wanted to be a musician. And then the other, it's actually very, I hadn't thought about it until now, but we went to like career guidance person specifically in Wexford, who was one of the best career guidance people in the country, supposedly, because my parents didn't really believe that that was the career. Although they were completely supportive, they were like, okay, you're going to do this music thing, of course, but what, what are you going to make your living from? You know, it was that, that was always there. There wasn't an exact belief from them mm -hmm. that, yeah, you're going to make a living from this. Um, and so, yeah, we went, I did all those aptitude tests and everything. And I, at the time I was thinking of studying marine biology in UCC and I was massively interested in that. And that was an area I was almost going into and uh my parents said you can put down one music course on the the ca what was it the cae or cao oh god i've forgotten now <laughs> whatever the university submission form so i selected ucc and i went and did the audition that was the only one i did um and i was accepted and to be honest once i was accepted for that there wasn't really i just said to them like that's what i want to do you know and they were just really supportive they were like okay you know, um, and they're very pragmatic people. I, my, my dad at the time, when I made that decision, he spoke to a lot of professional musicians um, and he, he did get really good advice at the time, um, which was like, learn to read the dots was one of the kind of pieces of advice that was coming like back from a lot of musicians, which is just, you know, that skill set, learning to read music actually played into a lot of things that kind of followed. Um, so that was great advice, not to just, not to just be a busker in a way, but be a, again, a professional in terms of having a skill set that is very hireable and a skill set that's very employable is reading docs because there's just loads of work in that. So I always had that nice pragmatic approach as well, which was, 
there is work. This is definitely this work exists. This playing in pits, playing for musical societies, playing in orchestras, that is a job. I know that's a job. The being in U2 or being in Pearl Jam, meh, that's a little bit unsure how you're going to make that happen, you know? And so I always kind of kept the two of them side by side, like constantly skilling up, constantly learning things that were just employable skill sets while still always like exploring my creativity. God, it, it does sound, it does sound wonderfully pragmatic. Do you know what I mean? It sounds like it's been a really useful way of going about it. That's fed both sides. And I, I love to hear that musicians call it reading the dots as well. <laughs> I just, <laughs> as a non-musician, just assumed that was something you wouldn't do, but I love it. Well, I mean, I think I'm using my dad's kind of parlance there, but yeah, really, because you would say, yeah, reading dots or, yeah. And, and then jumping forward, right? Jumping back to uh, Eat My Noise and what you were talking about there, that decision to, you're talking about kind of adding intelligence to music and creating something bigger or something new at least because yeah. i would imagine as someone who is outside of your particular sector um i'd imagine that you could have just kept on playing in bands at weddings uh knocking out gigs working in a quartet just playing and yeah. but it feels like you there was a turning point there where something happened and you were like well let's expand what we do let's get arts council funding let's see what we can build what what do you feel prompted that um you know in that way i i should give peter a lot of credit because he was quite expansive thinker in that way and um he he kind of very quickly kind of came up with this feeling of like he's a bit cynical and he was kind of a bit of the mind that music doesn't have much value or at least it's getting a little bit swamped and there's so many bands and there's so many people making music how do you make your music stand out how do you make your music special and so he quickly got on this idea of like create an experience which be kind of became our motto for eat my noise for pretty much the the seven years or eight years we ran it which was how is this an experience rather than just a gig how is this affecting people what narrative journey can we bring people on with music what emotional journey but not just music how how is lights feeding into that how is visuals feeding into that how is uh, absence of sound feeding into that you know we really took a lot of the concepts that we had from the contemporary kind of ma mm -hmm. which was a lot of avant-garde stuff and and at the time our thought, thought process was how do you make avant-garde accessible um, and our big kind of logic and understanding, which I still believe is people will listen to like the weirdest noises if you give them like a solid beat. And so, so you can do really, really strange out there stuff. And we did that and we love those sounds. We, we really liked those kind of clashy, contemporary, not really in any space, like big clusters of noise sometimes. But if you just put a kick drum underneath that, people are like, okay, I can accept all of this noise. But if, if you take that away, people have no tether and they just swim off into kind of boredom, I guess, because they don't really know what they're holding on to or what they're listening to. And so we played with that, with their shows. And I mean, I think that was, that just again, organically developed over years how we improved that, that concept. But we just played a lot with going into like full washes of noise for four or five minutes and at the point where we felt we were getting bored we would drop some big beat or we would drop some tune or we would drop some melody and so that was our way of trying to bring new audiences to contemporary music by just kind of giving them little bite-sized bits of it like little small little chunks of it and saying yeah here's something pretty out there and pretty weird but we're going to bring you back again and and in that way you can always just like you know give them some rope and take it back give them some rope and take it back um, and I think just the scale of that stuff naturally lent itself to exploring how, how are we actually going to do that? Um, which, which led to the arts council stuff. We, we obviously through, you know, through university and after university, we were starting to introduce to that stuff. Like a lot of my lecturers were obviously getting funding for their shows and for their music. And things. So, so I knew that that existed, that world existed. Um, but the band stuff was still happening and that, that was interesting for me, that split, that those two things were happening. I was still going up to 
Whelan's on a Friday night with the hard ground and we'd all sit in a van for four hours, drive up and get paid 20 euro each to play to a room of 10 people. You know, mm. that was still going because I still, um, I still believed in that, like the, the band thing, the live music thing, that made me feel great, you know. Um, that really fulfilled a, an emotional part of my being, to be on stage playing the bass with the band in a live context just gets you in this flow state, gets you in this really elevated musical state. Whereas the Eat My Noise stuff is quite cerebral. Like it's a lot of time in front of the laptop. It's a lot of time composing. It's a lot of time programming lights, programming visuals, um, and a lot of administration and, and stuff like filling out arts, arts council applications, insurance forms, fire safety certificates, all of this stuff. And the feeling's different. I'm really always used to note how different the two of those felt that one felt very bodily and very emotional and very in the now and the other felt quite cerebral because you make this huge thing and then you press play on it and you sit back and you you watch it play out you know you watch it un unfold and I, I don't know they, I, they, they, they kind of they kind of both had a different feeling for me and um, throughout and so it wasn't so much a shift um, that I went from this band thing and then say, okay, we're going to do this Eat My Noise thing. They were really just moving in parallel with each other um, for a long time. I mean, the, the impression I get is that it's to, A, that it sounds like it was really, they were both instinctive needs. Like that yes. cerebral stuff and that sort of emotional beat of being in a band with people. They're, it sounded like, it comes across like it's two sides of the same musical spectrum or different musical spectrums and one was being satisfied with the cerebral experimental element, but there was a real sense that this isn't enough for me fully. Actually, this yeah. uh, being in a band needs to have a thing as well. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds a little bit like, or I loved how that initial decision with Eat By Noise and your work with Peter there seemed to come out of really realistic questions around, well, you know, how do you get people to, access this music that might not be in the mainstream what's really special about our music and how can we put that out there it strikes me that maybe if you weren't asking those questions you might not have uh, yeah i've created Eat my noise or carried on that way that, that sounds like it was quite a an influential point to be asking those questions that allowed the rest of that to grow is, is that sort yeah. of accurate or absolutely yeah absolutely that was born out of those those questions and and born out of sometimes, uh, one of the thoughts we had for a while, which is quite commercial, I guess, was like, what will look really good on a poster? Like, what will, what will make you just go, I want that. I want to go to that, you know? Like, sometimes just like, whatever, this band in this venue, kind of go, music, do I want to sit in a chair and drink a pint and watch a gig? I don't know. Like, but you kind of have something programmed into your being about what a gig experience might be. Whereas with the other things we had, maybe we did a choir piece with 16 speakers hanging over the head of the audience. And there was one voice in each speaker with a live choir on the outside of, of that event. And so the idea, the, the show was called In Choir. And the idea was that you could walk through a choir. You could stand under an individual speaker and say, oh, okay, that singer's singing that part, this singer's singing that part. But if I step back from the 16 speakers, I hear the full recorded choir and the full live choir. And, and for instance, something like that was born out of the idea of wanting to do a choir piece, but also how will that inspire? How will, how will you get people in the door to that, you know? And, um, and I think that was always a nice question to ask as well. Like what's the experience? How, when you write out the, and sometimes writing out those arts kinds of forms helps that as well, because you're actually writing out what will people experience? What am I actually going to make here before I make it? You know, and you define it in your own head a little bit. Um, and it was, it was around asking those questions um, that, that those things kind of developed. And yeah, I mean, I'm really glad they did um, because I think we managed to create something that was was special, even though it never got to any any tourable kind of scale. And, and maybe that's another interesting thing to talk about about like what success means for those things. Sometimes, you know, um, 
they were super successful in their own right. They headlined something like the Midsummer. They got a lot of people in the, the show we did, uh, Flux for the, the organ in St. Finbar's Cathedral. That sold out four nights and it was 300 people a night. Um, but that was it. It toured, it, it toured there. We got it to Kilkenny just there in 2019. And that's the one show we're trying to get moving, but it's really hard to get those, those further afield, you know, and to get them out of Ireland. Well, it, it, it sounds like, a, a, what's also good as well, what strikes me as interesting is the idea of this, you need to be creating an experience. Quite often, I think, in a lot of artistic forms, there's a sense of, well, it's art and therefore it should be enjoyed. There's mm -hmm. this sort of imperative, even with, you know, in theatre, it's accepted people will just stand and clap at the end. I've always felt like that should be very much <laughs> a choice, how, how different things would be if you yeah. didn't have to do that at the end. So it sounds like you were really questioning yourselves around that. And I wonder just briefly to, to talk on that idea of success, looking back on that, because there's always a, a polarity between, you know, commercial success, the ideas of what you should be doing as yes. an artist, and then a very different sense of the most successful things I think I have done are things that very few people have seen. In my world, it's like, well, that was massive for me. Um, but, you know, so what was in hindsight then looking back, do you define that as, as a success when you look back on it? Um, artistically, very much so. Yeah, mm -hmm. artistically, all those shows um, I'm super proud to have made. And just if I go back and I look at the images or look at the video or look at the thing, I'm like, that's amazing. I think the should, and I, I'm really training myself lately to try to remove that word from my language, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a word I don't find useful anymore. But that, that should feeling certainly is it should have toured or it should have gone further. That, I mean, that we can't really um, pin down as to, to why it didn't. We put in the energies afterwards and it just, they were either too big um, to tour or they, I don't think we had the experience before making the show to realize, well, how is this going to pack down into one box and get on a boat? Like it's, it's not, it's too big a thing. Um, so yeah, they were successful, but if we would have defined them truly as successful if other festivals had come and said, we love that show, we want you to bring that show to you know, France, we want you to bring that show to Germany, we want you to bring that show around Europe. That, that, looking back, I would have defined that as a bigger success if there had been some sort of, I guess if more people had seen them, you mm -hmm. know, which is what you're saying, sometimes your best work, a certain amount of people see them, but you always want more people to see it, especially when it's your best work. You're like, I wish everyone had seen that one and not this one, you know? Um, it sounds also there that there's a, it's, it's success is broader than just the one thing there. You were like, artistically, yeah. it's definitely a success. And then, so it, yeah, it, it gets the feeling of, well, actually there's so much in the idea of what success might be and there's so many different aspects to it. That's yeah, I think, I think the three, the three might be like monetary success, artistic success, and then maybe like reach or um, what would that, how would you define that? Just the amount of people that see the thing, you know, the amount of engagement it has, um, you know, that's a massive form of success as well, you know. That's a good little tr tripod of success yeah. in that one there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so those shows didn't, didn't tour internationally, but I know you ended up... Uh, yeah leaving Cork uh, yeah. and for Spain. And so, you know, I, I'd imagine that it sounds like you were at that period quite well established to a degree. I mean, you're creating broad, you know, broad new pieces of music, work and composition that were headlining festivals. You were also working professionally as a musician touring about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that I'm sure for a lot of people would have been just fine and enough and, and that. But for you, it, it feels like as an outsider, you, you made quite a big change, quite a big shift. So what prompted or what led to you being where you are now in Barcelona? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't a career decision is the truth. It was, it, it was a personal decision. Um, and yeah, it, it, I mean, it's changed my career a lot. And I think in many positive ways, which I can talk about, but um, a lot of that was just, getting married to, to my wife, Ksenia, and she's Russian, and she tours a lot. She's a, a very well-recognized dancer herself. And so she was working in Europe every weekend. And long story short, Ireland's not in the Schengen zone. Uh, 
And so she got, if she got a visa, like an Irish residency, which she was approved for, um, we could have lived in Ireland, but she would have a non-Schengen visa, which meant that all her work in Europe, she would have had to apply for visas, a Schengen visa each time. So that was the, that was the crux of it really at the time was like, okay, we, Ireland's not going to work for the next foreseeable future for us to live together with, with her career and my career. And um, I just felt like an organic movement as well in my career to say, actually, it could be really good for me to like fully step out of my own and not, um, yeah, just to try to find my own career in complete autonomy, like arrive in a city and ask myself, who am I like fully independently? Who am I? Um, which has been the, one of the hardest things to do because I think one of my natural roles um, as a bass player naturally kind of, and as a musician has been a supportive role. Like I've always been in projects where I ring a lot and I create a lot and I support and uplift and, and all those kind of things, but not entirely independently. It's always been in bands or been in Eat My Noise and things like that. So. That has been a huge shift the last three years to come here and say, okay, now I'm my own person fully, my own artist fully, and, and what do I do with that now? Um, so that was it, yeah, it was, it was that more of a, also just during that period, I think what gave me the confidence to shift there was a lot of my work was moving online. Um, a lot of the work I was getting paid for was online. And also in truth, for the first two years, I was very, very like 50-50 or even 60-40 Ireland, Spain, because I kept doing the gigs. I kept coming back for all the performances. I kept coming back for, for Panto or I tried block book like some group of, okay, there's a wedding here, which will pay for the flight. And then there's three nice gigs with the bands I want to play with that will, you know, balance that out. And so I was like really hopping back and forth for the first the first two three years. This is the first year I'm like here fully here. Yeah, I, I always find it's um yeah. I mean it's familiar, but always fascinating working working as a coach with people because there's so much um I guess what seems like a rational resistance around the idea of change, mm -hmm. and, and also a perception that change would happen really quickly, and if it doesn't, it's wrong. So yeah. it sounds like for you, there was that really natural thing of a sort of ambivalence towards change, sort of things are quite nice in Cork, actually. I do need to, to move, but I, you know, I can go back and I can do a little bit and that sort of, which is, a, I think, a real natural process. But quite often it can be perceived as, well, if it was right for me, it would be right for me straight away and it would instantly happen and it would be easy. And as it's not easy or instant, mm -hmm. then maybe it isn't worth doing so. It, it's yeah it's interesting to see that again that actually the reality of it is that it's a it's a process but you brought up something really interesting there i think for me as well with this idea of stepping out from from the bass player position of the band to solo artists and and as an actor uh and especially working with a lot of actors it's, it's the same kind of thing so a lot of actors are essentially in a supportive serving role mm -hmm. and then it's a huge jump into writing or creating something that seems very unnatural and very different so it sounds like you had a nice change of location yeah that's allowed a bit of a change of perspective but also maybe demanded to some degree that yes. there was changes but also it sounds like luckily which might link into i guess our times now with covid that a lot of the work was facilitated by being allowed to be online as yeah. well that there was something that was enabled actually in a way so what was that like? What was that process? How did you begin stepping out from being in the band into being a solo artist, making your own stuff? And all those other hats that you have now, the producing hats and the sound media hats and all those, what was that like? Yeah, it was, again, it was quite organic and it was inspired by that change. So sometimes I think, I think what resonates with me when I'm talking to you is this idea of, again wading in over my head a little bit that I think there was that idea of okay I need to move to Spain I don't know how I'm going to do that but I'm making the decision to do that and just over years of trusting myself I was like okay I'll, I'll make it work I'll figure it out somehow I've always figured it out so I'll continue to figure it out um, and, and so that did very much lead to this kind of thread of online entrepreneurial kind of things and the media work um, because 
and it was organic in the sense I did 12 years of this gigging thing in Ireland and I did five, six nights a week when I was doing that, like every night out playing. Um, and at some point I kind of had done my back in from lifting amps. Um, my ears were getting a bit tired. They were getting a bit ringy from doing a lot of gigs, even though I was wearing clogs. Um, and it had gotten a little stale for me, if I'm perfectly honest. I, I kind of had the same residencies for about four years in a row. And residencies that started out like, being super exciting, like, great, we get to be here every Tuesday night. We're going to be so tight. This is going to be great. Four years later, we found we were still playing the same songs we were playing four years ago. And it, again, started to feel like work. And that has sometimes been a good indicator for me when to move. Like, it's like, this is starting to just feel like a job and I never want this to be a job. Um, and so, so it wasn't such an unbelievably hard change to say. There were certainly things, Niall McKay band just released a new album and we were really excited about that. And there was things happening that I was like, mm, I really do want to be here for that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was excited to actually just make a break um, and make that shift. And so what happened when I moved to Spain was I just started emailing lots of people with my portfolio. I made a website, I made my online presence a bit stronger, and I just reached out to lots of people and said, I'm making this move, I'm looking for some work, you've given me work previously, or you haven't worked with me previously, but you know about me, here's my stuff, if you have any work, let me know, kind of an email. And so I just did this like huge outreach program to just like, okay, how am I gonna fill in this gap of all of these gigs now being like lost? How am I going to just buffer that income from that? And so that's what I did. I mean, I had, I mean, I should say as well at that point, uh, I had some music on RTE that was um, paying royalties and paying quite well. So that, so that kind of had a, a bit of a cushion there because that was just uh, kind of paying organically. And myself and Ksenia at that point, we set up an online school together um, two years before we made the move to Spain and that had started to gain a bit of steam and now when I moved to Spain I just went all in with that I was like okay I, I don't have gigs now I don't have that form of work so I need to again fill in that kind of space and I just put a lot of energy into figuring out how online schools work how e-learning works um, and it was it was again very much led by curiosity and, and led by kind of a passion for what is this world and what's the possibility of that world? And maybe also a question or a feeling. I don't know if you've ever tasted it. Maybe you have as an actor, like this passive income is like the sweetest income you'll ever make for me. And anyway. it's one of the, it's just something lands in your account for a thing you did six months ago and you go, Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't need to, I didn't need to be on the stage to, to do that. I didn't need to be actually present every minute of, of earning that money. That money is in, in its own way, just now operating outside of me. And that was a beautiful feeling. And when I tapped into that feeling, I was like, how do I get more of that? Because actually that's true freedom as an artist. For me, that's absolute freedom is when you can maybe not take the gigs you don't want to take, start saying no to the things you don't want to do and just do exactly what you want to do because you're not solely reliant on, on uh, those things for income. Um, That's really interesting. I mean, uh, the pass, uh, passive income wise, I guess as an actor, get quite a bit of it re regularly, but to the amounts of under five pounds usually, sterling. <laughs> <laughs> These little letters get posted in from some radio drama you did a decade ago for another two two pound seventy five. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not quite as 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 excellent as it sounds like it is in the music world. But what's interesting there is to hear you talk about finance uh, as not a dirty word, because quite often there's a sense of well, look, I don't want to sell out. I don't want to do something online. What well, just for the money? I mean, that's so cut off of my you know my art. And it sounds like for you that was an enabling factor it was like this passive income creates freedom for me to do exactly what i want to do and and that feels quite liberating and that feels quite artistic hearing you talk about it is that your experience of it yeah i mean i'm 
I'm a strange guy, I think, in terms of, maybe not so strange, I don't know, but in terms of money, my mother works in the bank. She's very, very good with money and, and always brought me up with a certain understanding and openness to speak about money. Um, and I, I, I ran into a lot of problems with that, like, and still do, because as you said, a lot of people have a dirty feeling around money or a guilt around money or don't want to talk about it in the arts. And anyway, um, I kind of always didn't mind thinking about that. And, and certainly then once I started getting this, this, well, I've been doing that from day one, to be honest. I've been doing the wedding gig so that I can play in the original band, you know, and I needed to, um, I needed to balance those and I was happy to balance those. They both seemed like they were from the same place. I was playing bass um, and I didn't mind that I was playing a wedding, really. Mm -hmm. If it was paying well enough that I could pay my rent and I could have a car and I could drive to that gig that I actually want to do and drive to that rehearsal and have all day free to go to whatever rehearsals or write whatever music I wanted. That seemed like a fair payoff to me to not have to work a nine to five job, um, which from my experience just eats up your time and eats up your energy so that when you come home, you don't have enough energy to make the thing you want to make. Um, and so, yeah, but I do, I do get that. And um, there's plenty of musicians I've been around um, who were offered pantos or offered wedding gigs or offer things and they, they won't do them. And, and all power to them. I really, really respect people that are like, this is art is so spiritual for me and I can't, I can't do that, you know? I can't sing. I, I do say singing is different. I understand singers. Singers singing in a wedding band who are out front and they have to really put something into it. Bass player, you can kind of sit in the back and do your thing, you know? Um, so I get that. But anyway, I digress a bit, but certainly I never had a problem balancing the two of those things. That It seemed like a necessity to to make money and clearly there wasn't money in playing original music at the time you know um, and in making original art and um, we could talk a bit about that as well like certainly with Eat My Noise although we were getting all the Arts Council funding and all those things it cost me and Peter money usually to make those shows even though we got well funded we paid everyone in the crew, all the tech, all the lighting, all the insurance, the venue, the musicians, everyone. And by the time that was done, we would often like come back and say, okay, here's 500 euro for you and 500 euro for me for six months work. You know, that, that happened. So I, I needed the other thing to, to make that work. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a universal thing, isn't it? That the problem of anybody who's creating art, an arts council or any of that experience will just about do enough if you're very lucky to pay yourself a week's wages at the end, but it's not a sustainable to some way, way of funding things because it's not putting anything in the bank to allow a progression financially, unless of course, like you say, you're, you've got other pots um, to, to work from. But something you said there was really, I think interesting to me in, in relation to quite often, it felt like when you went to Spain, there was a real jumping into, you know, I don't know how this online stuff works with the school and all that. And a real curiosity you said about, I'm just going to put energy into finding out how this stuff works. Um, yeah. And I think quite often there can be a, a problem with sort of identity, whether how an artist might see themselves or see what they do, that, that can stop any kind of change. You know, that there might be an idea of like, well, this thing would serve me really well, but I can't do that because well, I've always done this thing, and so this is what I am, essentially. It sounds like that was quite fluid, actually, and less sort of rigid for you. And it was something we were talking about at the very beginning before we started recording, and it was around uh, how, how you define a career. Because uh, some people have a very, it's very much their identity. It's, I, I am an actor or I'm a singer, and that's what I do, and it's solely that. And anything else takes me away from that. Uh, some people, it's the, it's the jobs they have, those should be successful moments but for you what is it how, how do you define your career or a career i mean it's shifted over the years um certainly in my 20s i was a bass player that would be the first thing that would come out of my mouth and, and often it's where you put your ego i guess like this is if someone wants to challenge me on this thing are you a bass player i'd say yeah i'm a bass player this is why you know and i felt i had a big center and core and and, and strong feeling around that and then the composer thing started to get equally strong where I had kind of a 
secure enough feeling that I'd say, yeah, I'm a bass player and I'm a composer. Um, and then, I mean, in the last three years, this move to Barcelona, again, a bit out of need. I was also started to read, um, I'm sure you've talked about this on this show a lot, like Julia Cameron, The Artist Way. Have you read that book? I have. I have indeed, yes. Yeah, I, I did that thing. And that did really open me way up to start thinking about creativity as it's just a tool. It's just a way of thinking. It's just a, a mindset. Um, for the world and that that opened up the entrepreneurial thing a little bit where it was just well i don't know every company is just a brand every brand is just a, an image and i've created images for bands before i've created images for shows before it's also just like a body of text like a blurb and i've created blurbs for bands before and it's just a facebook page and i've done that before so then i just started to kind of or it's just a website and i just started to see okay, i can kind of do anything really if if it's inspiring to me like if it's it's just if there's a need in the world or if there's a desire in me to make that thing then i can just do that so i will and i i kind of let that filter off when i came to spain about how much i define myself as a bass player or as a composer and it is very fluid for instance i haven't practiced bass all summer mm -hmm. um, and i did it last summer as well um it, it came from a decision, I don't know if you'll resonate with this, but I just wanted to actually say, I'm not a bass player uh, for June, July, and August. I'm not a bass player. And that was more of an internal decision because I didn't want to feel the guilt of not practicing every day. I wanted to actually have a summer where I had space and time and a, a real summer. And being a bass player sometimes kind of was like, oh, I need to do my two hours every day. And so I just switched that off. I'm starting to move those things and start to feel like, Today and for the next two months, I'm a media composer because I have work there. And then I know after that, I'm releasing this album in January and I'm going to do a tour as a double bass player. So I'm going to start practicing double bass a lot coming up to that. And I'm going to get really ready to be a great bass player for that. And then after that, I'm filling out arts, arts council applications for the next month. So I'm an administrator. And that kind of helped me to kind of just keep changing hats. But lately to try to find those hats by periods and do intense periods um because certainly trying to wear all of them all the time um i tried that model and it didn't work for me i just felt i was completely frustrated didn't have enough time in the day and wasn't focused and so now i try set out either days of the week that i'm doing a certain task or months that i'm doing a certain thing. So in January, I started my own album and that's all I did. I was just like, I am a composer for January. And you know, six, seven, eight hours a day, I went to the studio, I wrote music. And when I came home, my, my work was done and I was content. Um, and so, yeah, I do, I do see them all as fluid and how I define a career now is, for me, it's just making a, a, a good living and keep doing things I love doing, you know, have the freedom to explore my creativity and freedom to make what I want to make. Um, while living well, I mean, when I hit my thirties, I just, I stopped wanting to be a martyr or stopped wanting to be a broke musician. I wanted what a lot of my friends who had normal jobs had, like I wanted a nice apartment and to be able to go out and eat well and, you know, have a holiday and, have a normal life and potentially have kids and own a house. Those kind of things started to just kind of come up that I want those things. And why not use my creativity to get those things while still, you know, creating the art I want to create, you know? God, it sounds, it sounds beautiful. I mean, it's, I think that's what started all of these talks was the idea of what does it mean to live well as a creative in the world today? Yeah. I think I was very much tapping at that same idea because as a, there's a sort of an idea that, well, you have to be a martyr to a degree and there's a very limited level of what you can get or what you can do. But when you talk about creativity in that mindset way and the way in which you've let it kind of fall off you in different areas to kind of create what you want to, uh, sounds, sounds ideal. It sounds like you've really sort of, yeah, really allowed yourself to expand in a way that kind of works well for you. Um, and with that in mind, what because I know we spoke a little bit about this before on a very practical level, because it sounds like the way in which you are now thinking about how you are doing your work, and I'd have the same thing as Nactor around that tyranny of I must do certain things each day, 
and and for me i think covid is the first time in my life where i've been fully allowed <laughs> fully allowed not to have the tyranny of oh i should be doing this thing and acting i should be doing this i think for at least a lot of actors it's allowed everyone to a degree to take a breath and go there's yeah. no work there's no work so yeah. for at least a couple of months I don't feel guilty. <laughs> yeah. there's no work so there's no guilt um but for you, what, what are the skills now? Because I think we are moving from a place where working in the creative arts was always a little unpredictable and a little mm. volatile. And I think it's especially so at the moment. And, and maybe there's skills in there that can be used over a life sustainably. But what, yeah, what for you are things that you now recognise as these are skills that have allowed me to do what I'm doing now? Yeah. I, I mean, are they, the, maybe it's not a skill. I want to say like certainly just the clarity, like to, to follow your curiosity and curi follow your passion, you know, that's, I don't think it's a skill um, per se, but in general, just to move and be open and be flexible um, for me is something that's defined me um, to always be open-minded and, and to try dissolve my ego as much as possible around certain things um, has been something which, which has defined a lot of what I do because it allows me just to go into an area, as I said, that maybe I'm not so sure of and I can go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll find my way here. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll trust myself that I've done it before. I'll do it again. And that allows me to grow in, in so many spaces. Um, I think for me, this, this I, I hate that it has to be now. A thing with this ability to fill out arts council applications, do administration, be practical, be pragmatic, be your own manager. Um, I don't want that to be the way the world is. I really don't. I would love that musicians just make music and that actors just act, and we don't need to have all of these skill sets to, to make a career. But I just don't think there's any other way, or at least I haven't seen it other than top level people who can, who can get rid of that stuff. I, I you know, um, being around, well, being around so many people, being around Ksenia, who just has such an amazing, amazingly successful career, but still there's no one there to, to, to do the nuts and bolts stuff. She does it all herself. She does everything, you know? Um, so the ability to, um, yeah, the ability to, to separate those two sides, the pragmatic and the creative, and balance them. Um, and make sure that, that you're always on a, a steady ship, for me, is something important. Um, and I don't know how I've got that. I, I've always done that. I've always done the money's getting low, okay, put more energy into the money-making side of things. Money's good, okay, now put more energy into the creative side of things. And I've always kind of balanced those two things in some, in some way um, in terms of how much space I allow myself as a creative. Um, and I know people who have a hard time financially as creatives because they just do the creative, 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 creative. And I, I just have, for some of them, I haven't seen a payoff um, because they didn't put enough work into the outreach or the networking or the marketing or the funding or the whatever side of things. And they've got this amazing body of work that no one knows about. Um, and that's, I mean, I don't think that's fair. I think that person should exist. And I love that that person exists. Um, but I just, if they just had a bit more of this other skill set, this pragmatic side, they really could find an amazing career. And I think most of us now need to try find a balance of those things, even though it's uncomfortable, which, which is why, as I said, for me, it's really helped. And I got that advice early on to try just fully put on the administrative hat one day and fully put on the creative hat another day. Um, because they don't, they don't want to sit beside each other. Um, there's this creative coach I followed on line for a while. Um, this guy, Mike Monday and how he talks is really funny. You, you almost wouldn't want to believe him because he's really, really British and really just a little off the cuff. But his, his thinking is really good and it applies to music making the same thing. He's like, just do a day of creativity, no judgment. Just make, 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 make. Like, as soon as you start to judge, okay, shut it down, start the next thing, make, make, make. And then 
the next day, sit down and judge. Like do a day of fully judging. Okay, is that actually good? No. Is that actually good? Yeah, it has something. And to put to separate those parts of the brain is actually quite nice. Um, because they don't really want to live together, I don't think. I think judgment and administration or any of these pragmatic things with full flow creativity, they they, they don't like each other in some way, those parts of the brain. That's that's a really good point. It's a really good point to make those full full days either side of it and that judgment you talk of is definitely something i know a lot of writers have that thing of you know they're in about an hour into what they're doing and they're already judging it and therefore already it's editing way. yeah <laughs> already editing is like now's not the time now's not the time for that um but also it's it sort of sings this sort of pragmatic approach that you have around balancing these two things and the need for both of them just remind me of what you were talking about earlier around that eat my noise experience of you going well, how do we, we have the creative creative and how do we get people excited and interested in this? So it's, it feels like there's a, a thing you have, a way of seeing it. That's always about, well, how do I draw people into the experience that I'm making, uh, essentially? Um, we got about time maybe for one more question, I, I, if, that's, if that's cool. Yeah, I'm, really, away. Oh, yeah I'm, I'm really interested to know um, sort of what sort of, I always think it's a, it's a nice sort of question, what sort of emerging so quite often for people, you know, we're in the middle of stuff always. Of yeah. like, well, I'll try this idea, I'll try that idea, let's see what happens, we're in the middle of COVID. But I always think that for a lot of creatives, there's an idea of what's on the horizon. There's a sense of maybe I'm interested now in this area. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels like there's so many areas that you're working in, between entrepreneurial and media and whatever. What, what's currently got your interest? What's on the horizon that you're like, I'm curious about maybe that at some point in the future? Um, I'm, I'm really, to be honest, I'm very interested in creating a dance show at the moment. We've been kind of brewing that for a while with, with Ksenia, um, which is again, combining all my skill sets. Then that's something that I wanted to, I'm, I'm trying to, um, find a place where all the parts of me can exist in, in one thing. And I kind of had it with, with Unity, which was my, my jazz show, which is again, jazz and playing and performative, but still kind of AV and electronic. And, and the kind of final element of that that I felt I was missing was some sort of a theatrical setting for that. Um, so we're currently trying to make a, a show. Um, again, COVID kind of scuppered a lot of our, our work. But um, that's, that's really interesting me right now. Um, there's also something, I, I applied for funding and I'll see the, I really want to come back to Ireland a bit and I've been a bit obsessed with Irish music um, over the past while, like the last two, three years, I've just got a serious obsession with that kind of gloaming, uh, Earl Leonard and Quibi Norella and all of this, that scene and that sound. And, I feel like they're moving somewhere, but I want to, I would love to push it even further. Um, there's, I have a sound in my mind for that type of world that I want to kind of move into something that would be a little bit just me and trad, how I would approach Trish and music. Um, and that's just born a little bit of being here and on a daily kind of basis, uh, being more Irish than I've ever been because you're really faced with your Irishness when you're, in Spain all the time, every single time you have a conversation with anyone there, where's that accent or where, where are you from or, you know. So I find myself having that conversation and, and longing for a bit of a connection uh, with Ireland again. And so I think that's something I, I think I want to explore next year is, is orchestral, electronic, traditional music in some kind of way. So, sounds excellent, <laughs> sounds fantastic. Uh, yeah, it's mad. You don't really get referred to as Irish until you leave, do you? And then you have to deal with it in a different way. You're like, oh, everyone's referring to me as Irish. I guess I have to think about it differently now. Um, yeah. David, I, I can't thank you enough, man. I mean, I, I've, I, I've, for one, have learned so much just from hearing you talk. And there's definitely some ideas in there that uh, I've been secretly writing down as we've gone through. So thank you so much My for your pleasure. time. I really appreciate it. And I'll stick in all of the links to where people can find out more about what you were doing and what you have done, all the things that we've mentioned in mm -hmm. the comments below. But, um, but thanks again for your time on this lovely Spanish morning. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure.